Tonight, a royal arrival. This little thing is, is, is absolutely to die for, so I'm just over the moon. Prince Harry and Meghan welcome their first child, a baby boy. How the couple is breaking with tradition and reclaiming their privacy. Extinction is permanent, right? We don't have time to dither around. A dire warning, one million species are at risk of extinction and humans are to blame. It doesn't make any sense. You're saying you have a feature, but then if it doesn't work, well, sorry, that's too bad for you. When your electronic life goes down the toilet, even if your phone is water resistant, why it may not be covered for water damage. This is The National. That a royal baby was coming wasn't a surprise, but when it finally happened today, it was news that flew. Harry and Meghan, the Duke and Duchess of Sussex, welcomed a healthy boy, a little overdue, clearly arriving on his own time, maybe setting the path for a life that will be led in his own way. Renee Filipponi on the beauty of a big day. On the arrival of a baby boy! <laughs> Windsor's town crier delivered the happy news to a joyous crowd today. Baby boy Sussex, seven pounds, three ounces, born early this morning. Hey, what a fantastic day. Have you seen the smiles on everybody's faces? It's wonderful news. Yes, it's a complete shock. We're all feeling quite euphoric and we're all getting a bit drunk here. <laughs> Anne Daly drove down from Wales to celebrate, hoping to see the royal couple. But I think a lot of people have been very disappointed because we, we, we're all here for the wedding and uh, we thought perhaps she might come out. But while the couple had never planned to make a public appearance, Harry did make a surprise statement for the media. The proud father, who was by Meghan's side for the birth, clearly thrilled. This little thing is, is, is absolutely to die for, so I'm just over the moon. The media stationed in Windsor had been watching and waiting for so long, some started to wonder if the baby was already born and the family was hiding out. But no, Meghan was just overdue. The royal couple wanted the birth to be a private affair. Unlike William and Kate, there would be no photo op on the steps of the hospital. This couple didn't even say where Meghan gave birth, opting instead to share the happy news on Instagram, even before the traditional announcement made outside Buckingham Palace. This baby is seventh in line to the throne, very unlikely to ever be even a working member of the royal family, let alone a king. So. He can be afforded a lot more privacy and a bit more freedom to grow up away from the spotlight. The couple hasn't announced a name yet. Some of the leading contenders are Alexander, Albert and James. The new parents have promised to let the world get a glimpse of the new royal in a couple days. Renee Filipponi, CBC News, Windsor, England. So you saw him there a moment ago, a beaming Prince Harry today. Well, here's more of his surprise statement for the record. Mother and baby are doing incredibly well. Um, it's been the most amazing experience I could ever um, possibly imagine. Um, how any woman does what they do is beyond comprehension, but we're both absolutely thrilled um, and so grateful to all the love and support for everybody out there, um, from everybody out there. It's been, um, it's been amazing, so we just wanted to share this with everybody. Still thinking about names. Yeah, the baby's a little bit overdue. So we've had a little bit of time to think about it, but um, yeah, we're still, that's, that's, the, that's the next bit. But for us, I think we'll be seeing you guys in probably two days time as planned um, as a family to be able to share it with you guys and so everyone can see the baby. I haven't been at many births. Um, <laughs> this is definitely my first birth, uh, but it was amazing. Absolutely incredible. As I said, so where does the new royal baby fit into the line of succession? Well, first in line, of course, is Prince Charles, followed by Prince William, then come Will and Kate's children. Prince George is third, Princess Charlotte fourth, and their baby brother, Prince Louis. Prince Harry is sixth in line to the throne, followed by the new royal baby boy, who is seventh. Now, the baby may be pretty far from the throne, but he is a member of the most famous and watched family on the planet. Still, this royal couple is trying to break tradition a bit and forge their own path. So we asked royals expert Katie Nichol for some insight on what they're in for under this new spotlight. He 
grew up in the spotlight. He had the, the cameras trained on him from being a, a very little boy. So he knows the pressure of being in the media spotlight. Prince Harry has said himself that if he was lucky enough to have children, he'd want to give them an ordinary childhood. Well, how far can you give a royal child an ordinary childhood? Bye, Harry. Take you, Meghan. To be my wife. To be my wife. This is the first biracial baby to be born into the royal family. You know, the House of Windsor, a thousand years old. You know, not even 20 years ago would it have been, I think, almost unthinkable. It immediately makes them in touch, modern, contemporary. I think it's been a really great thing for the family. And it's going to be fascinating to see how much of that um, they're going to bring in terms of raising their child, you know, how modern, how progressive. Are we going to see them pushing this little boy around in a traditional silver cross pram? Or are we going to see Harry walking around the grounds of Windsor with the baby strapped against him in a little papoose? We know that their primary home is here at Frogmore Cottage, but there are early stage plans at the palace for the family to spend some time overseas in perhaps some of the Commonwealth realms and countries. Africa is apparently top of the list, but I think there's every chance that this little boy is going to spend a lot of his life um, in America. A couple, couple are talking about buying a possible holiday home in LA. Meghan wants to have those links back home and close to her mother. So I think, yeah, it's going to be a very well-traveled child. So we don't know where the baby's first royal tour will be, but Prince Harry will travel to the Netherlands this week to officially launch the countdown to the Invictus Games. So, all right, Rosie, something way more serious here. Let's move to Paris, <laughs> where scientists around the world gathered today with a pretty dire warning. They sure did, Adrian. The UN coordinated an unprecedented study of species at risk. Scientists in 50 countries took part, assessing all kinds of established research, and the outlook is grim. There is no doubt that this is certainly the most comprehensive report ever written with an incredible amount of detail. Biodiversity is important for human well-being and we humans are destroying it. The authors call it an extinction crisis. One million species of plant and animal at risk of disappearing, many within decades, and here's why. About three quarters of Earth's land has been severely altered or lost, plus two thirds of marine habitats and 85% of wetlands. But this isn't just about saving other species. It's a call to preserve a world that's becoming harder for humans to live in too. Cass Rusi starts with the view from Canada. The polar bear is an iconic symbol of Canada's north. These ones at Toronto's zoo are always a crowd favorite. But in their true habitat in Canada's north, an ugly truth is emerging. Conceivably, if we don't reverse our trends on this planet, it's in an imperiled ecosystem as well. Uh, if we can't save the places where these animals live, we have to ultimately ask, what's their future going to be? The list of endangered species in Canada risks getting longer, and it's not just climate change. We're farming more, we're building more, we're fishing more, and it all comes down with a cost. At least 50 Canadian species are under threat. There's the black-footed ferret in the prairies, the Blandings turtles in eastern Canada, the Vancouver Island marmot. As habitats vanish, some of these species are losing their homes. What Canada needs to do now, says this conservation biologist, is protect more land. But the challenge now is habitat loss. This is a challenge of our generation. And until we solve that, we're going to continue to have this extinction crisis, which is not just affecting wildlife, but is going to affect the quality of lives of, of people now and into, into the future. You know, Canada has always been pretty well known as a, a fairly nature forward country. However, in general, and that goes with the entire world, um, on an individual basis and on a policy basis, we definitely need to change what we're doing and, and become more progressive in how we're considering the environment in our policies. Canada has pledged to protect 17% of its land by next year, but so far it has only managed to reach 11%. Cass Rusi, CBC News, Toronto. The UN report sounds an urgent alarm, but its authors also have a hopeful message. Endangered species can be helped. Erin Collins takes a look at efforts in Calgary to save a familiar frog. 
They used to be everywhere in western Canada, but these days the northern leopard frog is harder to find. Endangered in BC, at risk in Alberta, it's not easy being green. Well, frogs all over the world are actually in trouble. 40% of all frogs are threatened with extinction. Wetland species like the leopard frog are often hardest hit, threatened by a shrinking habitat, invasive species and diseases, and of course climate change. A trend a team based at the Calgary Zoo along with colleagues in BC are hoping to reverse, reintroducing them into their natural habitat one hop at a time. So bringing species or bringing these frogs back to places where they used to be, where they disappeared, um, through either moving them from the wild in one place to another place or by being able to breed them in captivity and then putting them out again in the wild. Well, it's important work because what happens in the world's wetlands is a sign of what will likely happen everywhere else. So basically an alarm system for humanity. If frogs are doing badly, chances are the environment is bad for us too. They depend on good water conditions, good land conditions, and if frogs are disappearing, we need to worry. If we can save frogs and provide environments where they do well, then probably we will do well too. A reminder of how nature connects all species and how a frog's fate on the prairies serves as a warning for the rest of us. Aaron Collins, CBC News, Calgary. I had no idea frogs could tell us so much. If you want to know more about the UN's report, be sure to check out our newsletter. Today's edition of The National Today goes through the nitty-gritty of the report. It also takes a hard look at some of the other recent reports on the planet's health. Hit the subscribe button at cbcnews.ca slash the national. In Moscow, investigators recovered the two flight data recorders today from the wreckage of that Aeroflot plane that crash-landed in flames yesterday. 41 of the 78 people on board were killed after the Russian-made jetliner declared a mid-air emergency. We still don't know the cause, and as Chris Brown reports, getting to the truth may be harder than you'd think. The charred frame of the Sukhoi Superjet was lifted today from where it crashed Sunday as the focus shifted to the politically sensitive question of what brought the jet down. This fortunate passenger who got out unscathed claims he saw a white light right after takeoff. The possibility that lightning caused the crash has been played up by Russian state media, rather than pilot error or a mechanical problem. But planes are built to withstand lightning strikes, and it doesn't explain why the pilot declared an emergency and then had to come in for a fast, hard landing, creating a deadly fireball in the process. Stories on Russian TV have also suggested that some of the survivors may be partially to blame for the high death toll because some of them took their bags, leaving others trapped inside. The coverage likely reflects the fact that the Sukhoi Superjet is a prestige project for President Vladimir Putin, the first Russian-made commercial aircraft since Soviet times. But there have been repeated problems with its engines, leading to frequent groundings. Putin foe Alexei Navalny wrote on Instagram today, it was important for the authorities to prove, look, we're able to make a plane under Putin. Huge money was spent on the project. Superjet is an unfinished aircraft which cannot be used in full commercial operation. Alexander, um, on state TV talk shows, Navalny never gets mentioned by name, but it appeared the rebuttals from government officials were aimed squarely at him. Some people are trying to create a false impression that the state will not protect its people. It's totally false, said Alexander Hinstein. Russia's transportation minister said the day he sees no reason to ground the fleet of super jets, but it appears some carriers are taking action on their own. One regional Russian airline said today it was cancelling its order for 10 more of the aircraft. Chris Brown, CBC News, Moscow. The flames engulfing that plane were so big, so intense, it's hard to believe anyone inside survived. But from those who did, today came stories of sheer horror. With the cabin windows melting and the flames growing, some of the passengers say it was the crew members who saved their lives, staying calm while passengers panicked. In darkness and with smoke all around them, some people froze, others stopped to get bags from the compartments above. After kicking out a door, this flight attendant had to shove people out of the plane to keep the evacuation moving. At the rear of the cabin, this steward died trying to release another slide. 
all but one of the 41 people killed, including two children, had seats in the back half of the plane. Row 10, the dividing line between life and death. And late today, Aeroflot announced it will pay compensation up to $41,000 to passengers who escaped alive and about $103,000 to relatives of those who did not. A weekend of violence in Israel and the Gaza Strip has given way to a bit of an uneasy ceasefire. International mediators are pressing for a wider easing of, uh, of hostilities. But as Paul Hunter reports, wanting it and achieving it are not the same thing. In Gaza City, a quiet morning with the chance to consider the intensity of the violence there this weekend. But with the truce and amid the rubble, anger. This truce will be the same as previous ones, said this man, a week or two until the Israelis are back to fight again. On the Israeli side, an equal dose of fury from those now contemplating the shattered homes from Palestinian rocket fire, who hold an equally firm view the truce won't hold. It will all repeat itself, and we have achieved nothing. Israel, this man says, needs to strike them very hard. It was a brutal weekend, apparently sparked when Palestinian frustrations over the Israeli economic blockade of Gaza, itself aimed at quelling violence, led to shots being fired into Israel, wounding two Israeli soldiers. It then escalated quickly. Many hundreds of rockets were fired into Israel, and in return, Israel struck more than 300 targets in Gaza. More than two dozen Palestinians were killed, militants and civilians. On the Israeli side, four civilians were killed, the first civilian deaths from rocket attacks since the 2014 Gaza war. Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu visited some of the wounded today. He said later, this is not the end of the campaign and will keep Israeli forces in place. As militant leaders in Gaza suggested, they may try other tactics against Israel. While both sides wonder, how long will the truce hold? Paul Hunter, CBC News, Washington. Here are some of the other stories we're watching tonight on The National, including results from a by-election in British Columbia. Polls close in just over an hour in the riding of Nanaimo Ladysmith on Vancouver Island. The seat has been vacant for several months since the NDP Sheila Malcolmson stepped down to run in provincial politics. This is the final by-election before October's federal election. I hope that when I rejoin my family and friends, that the country will be in a place without xenophobia, injustice, and lies at the helm of our country. Michael Cohen is a prison inmate tonight. Donald Trump's former lawyer started his three-year jail sentence for financial crimes and lying to Congress. It's expected he'll serve his time in the minimum security section of a federal prison near New York City. This is a large, uh, a large building with very heavy volumes of flame and smoke right now. Crews are battling a fire this evening at an adult education centre in Toronto. It started on the third floor and seven people working on the roof had to be rescued. Still ahead on The National, we begin a special series on guns in Canada. Tonight, the divide between those who've always owned guns and those who see their most violent effects. And did you spot it? Game of Thrones leaves an unauthorized prop in a scene and the internet, well, it lights up. Plus, has this ever happened to you? You go into the bathroom and you accidentally drop your smartphone into the bowl. No, that's gross. Why some cell phones marketed as waterproof may not be covered for that kind of damage. That's next. How many of us can relate to this? You go to the bathroom and whoops, you drop your phone into the toilet. Fortunately, many devices are now apparently water resistant, meaning they should survive splashes, spills, even that getting stuck in the toilet. But Eric Rankin found that doesn't necessarily mean you're covered. 
24-year-old Eliana Abramovich bought a brand new Huawei P20 Pro from Fido in February, got a protective case and screen protector, and went on a vacation to Mexico in March. Three days in, she dropped her phone in the toilet. Well, first, I thought, oh crap, now I have to get this phone out. Eliane wasn't too worried. She bought the Huawei phone because it had an IP67 rating, the second top international standard for water resistance. But the phone died. Eliane says when she returned home, she learned her water-resistant phone wasn't covered for water damage. Huawei told her she had to pay for potentially costly repairs or buy a new phone. It doesn't make any sense. You're saying you have a feature, but then if it doesn't work, well, sorry, that's too bad for you. Online, Huawei bills its P20 Pro as being real-world ready, promising owners can go wild with a phone that's completely water-resistant to one meter. Like Huawei, most recent Apple iPhones and Samsung devices have the same water resistance rating. Samsung even suggesting its IP67 standard phones be rinsed with water after exposure to other liquids. As this online test of a Huawei P20 Pro shows, the rating means the phone should be able to sit for 30 minutes in one meter of water and still work. But Elian's phone was in just 12 centimeters of water for 40 seconds. It's supposed to be able to go underwater one meter for half an hour. And that's not what happened, but it killed the phone. This tech expert believes some IP67 rated phones might not be sealed properly, and manufacturers need to acknowledge that. Water damage should not occur to that phone during that time. So if water damage does, we're looking at a manufacturer's defect. In an email to CBC News, Huawei repeated its warranty doesn't cover water damage. If our authorized service center finds any indicator of water damage, the warranty gets voided. But a spokesperson for the company issued a conflicting statement. Huawei Canada honors warranty claims for liquid damage, unless there is clear misuse. The benefit of any doubt for these types of cases always goes to customers. Huawei is now offering to repair Elian's phone under warranty. But she just wants the big cell phone manufacturers to revise their water-resistant promises. I really think there's a bigger issue with the, the warranty, and until that starts getting looked at, I'm not really going to be happy. Eric Rankin, CBC News, Vancouver. Coming up on The National, why kids' TV is lacking diversity and what's being done to fix it. But first, the debate over guns in Canada. Gun control is not an argument about cigarettes. It's not an argument about seatbelts. So that's why we say stay in your lane. So that's not likely to happen that I'm going to shut up. We believe that this is very much a public health issue. Our special series begins right after this. Tonight, we begin a special series on gun violence in Canada. It's on the rise with often deadly consequences. In 2013, guns accounted for 27% of homicides. Since then, the number has jumped to nearly 40%. In the coming days, we'll show you how legal guns get here and we'll examine the gun control legislation now before Parliament. That's something that always divides this country. For many Canadians, legal gun use is just part of daily life, far removed from the city shootings that make the news. Tonight you'll hear from a longtime member of Parliament who has fought against gun control, but you will also hear from an ER surgeon calling for restrictions. Terence McKenna has been gathering perspectives from both sides, and here's what he found. Ambulances race through the streets of Toronto almost every day with victims of gun crime. 10-9 to Sunnybrook on a CTAS-1 FTT. Patient is unresponsive, GCS-3. Police report 631 gunshot victims last year, with gun homicides up 31% from the year before. The victims are rushed to the major trauma centers in the city, one at Sunnybrook Hospital, one at St. Michael's downtown. Dr. Najma Ahmed is a trauma surgeon at St. Michael's. So we're getting ready for surgery. These patients okay. have very serious and life-threatening injuries with lots of blood loss, multiple organs injured, multiple holes in injury from the blast of the bullet to multiple organs. And in the first 
hour or hour or so we're focused on just saving the patient's life. You know, when you look carefully at this problem, we see that there's been an increase in the number of uh, gunshot victims in urban centers like Toronto, but also in rural settings. And a lot of people don't really appreciate that the per capita death rate from firearms is higher in rural settings than it is in urban settings. The key factor in the political debate about gun control in Canada has always been the divide between the city and rural communities. At this livestock auction outside Owen Sound, Ontario, farmers come to buy and sell their cattle. The bidding is fast. The signals from buyers almost imperceptible. This is the Federal Electoral District of Bruce Gray Owen Sound. <laughs> How you doing, Scott? And the local member of parliament is conservative Larry Miller. Anyway, so take care. Yeah. He got into federal politics 15 years ago because he was upset by the Liberal government's gun control laws, and he worked hard to repeal them. How are you doing, sir? Not too bad, yourself? Not bad, good to see you. Yeah. Anyway, so did you find some cattle you like today? In the coffee shop adjacent to the auction, most people would like to tell city folk to take a hike on the gun yeah. issue. I totally get and I totally understand why people in downtown Toronto have more of a fear or dislike for handguns or guns in general than somebody in rural Canada. And the difference is understanding. The rural-urban divide, and yes, it's there. What the observation of most people who live in rural Canada is that the people in the city don't give a damn about our way of life as long as their way of life is uh, being looked after, and that, that bugs the heck out of us. In fact, the homicide rate in Canada is 45% higher in rural areas than in cities. When there is a gun in the home, the homicide rate is three times higher, and the suicide rate almost five times higher. Three quarters of gun deaths in Canada are suicides. You know, a lot of this discussion though has come down to handguns, whether they're gonna ban handguns. Why do people in rural areas need handguns? I, why do you need a car? To get to work. You don't need a car. You could, you could find a way, you could get a cab, whatever, but you want a car. You're gonna use that car. And w what's the difference? As long as I follow the law, whether I have a car or I have a, a handgun or whatever, um, fine. Guns are a way of uh, life. It's a family thing uh, for us. Larry Miller took me on a tour of his riding. Like we're just, where we're driving here, this is one of the best deer crossings in the whole area. I've got uh, four brothers, uh, three sons, two of my sons hunt. He sees himself locked in mortal combat with the leaders of the gun control coalition in Canada. You know, there's an old saying out there, if a conservative doesn't like to hunt, he just doesn't hunt. But if you're a liberal, you try and ban, make everybody so nobody can hunt. Their goal is ultimately to take guns out of uh, people's hands. They're making us law-abiding people feel like criminals, and that's what he's Good evening, like. and thank you for the opportunity to speak on this important subject. Dr. Ahmed recently testified before the Senate Committee studying gun law proposals. She focused on gun violence against women. Last Wednesday, I told a woman that her 25-year-old daughter was dead. She had been shot by her common-law partner. The fatal wound was the bullet that tore through her brain from behind, and on the grandmother's lap sat a nine-month-old daughter. This was a preventable tragedy. Well, the Femicide Report um, documents that in uh, 2018, there were 148 women killed by femicide in Canada. And the most common method of killing was by gun. And there's quite strong evidence to suggest that guns, firearms can be used as methods of intimidation in domestic abuse situations. A lot of women, particularly, unfortunately, in rural settings, uh, are held hostage by a firearm that's in a home.
Conservative MP Larry Miller took us to his local gun range, which provides safety courses on the correct use of a firearm. Approach the firing line. My safety is on. Load your firearm. I asked him about the polls that show that while men who own guns are against more gun control, the women who live with them are in favor and feel less safe if there is a gun in the home. Uh, there's probably some women who feel like that. That's certainly not, uh, I don't think, prevalent in this area. At least I've sure never heard it. Figures can lie and liars can figure. And uh, so I don't, I don't buy that. Again, coming back to those polls, you see two-thirds of Canadians are in favour of more gun control, and yet basically your side is winning, right? You took down the long gun registry. Why is that? Why are we winning? Yeah. Well... When you start attacking the innocent Canadian and there's no positive outcome of it, meaning public safety, there's bigger fish to fry. Go and uh, deal with how these guns are coming in and um, you know they're just not willing to do that because it's not easy, it's hard. The power of the gun lobby and rural gun enthusiasts was on display recently at this Durham, Ontario town hall meeting in MP Larry Miller's riding. Minister, thanks again uh, for being here. The special guest is Bill Blair, the former Toronto police chief who is now the federal minister of border security. Mr. Blair has been mandated in a letter from the prime minister to look into the possibility of banning handguns and assault weapons in Canada is here to listen to what rural Canadians have to say about gun control. The gun lobby is here. The Canadian Coalition for Firearms Rights has invited its members to attend, and their supporters are sprinkled throughout the hall. Um, I stand here as a gun owner uh, of about 10 years, uh, alongside what appears to be about uh, several hundred of the fellow members of my community, all of whom are more thoroughly vetted than Trudeau's token Syrian refugees or the people pouring across our supposedly secure border. And I think as a former police officer, you should know better and should have tossed that mandate paper back in Trudeau's face. <laughs> Sir, the only thing this all says is every time the Liberals are in power, they come after us. That's right. That's true. There is no way you will ever tell the Canadian people they cannot have guns. We will keep them and we will hide them. Respectfully, I will say I consider gun ownership a right and rights are inalienable. It's only governments that choose to acknowledge them or not. Firearm ownership is a privilege. It's a, it's a privilege earned by each and every person in this room. It's a privilege earned because you obey the rules. You follow the law. You are responsible in your ownership. You're responsible in, and you obey the law on how you acquire your firearms, how you use your firearms, how you store your firearms, and how you dispose of your firearms. That is a, a, a privilege that each and every one of you has earned, and I thank you for that. But, but it is not a right to, to carry a firearm in this country. It's a privilege to be earned, and all of you have done so. Bill Blair is now at the end of his public consultation process and has made his report to the Prime Minister after hearing very different messages from Canadian cities and rural areas. Do the right thing, Bill. That's me. Do the right thing. I don't envy Bill. I respect him for coming, but, you know, he sure as heck didn't make me think that uh, I was, you know, going to be any better off as a firearms owner either. So Bill Blair has been asked to go and look at, very seriously, at a handgun ban and an assault weapon ban. What will happen politically if the Liberals go ahead and do that? If you want to do something really stupid and, and help the opposition, which is us, then go ahead and do that. There's a very strong, very vocal, very well organized lobby of people who own firearms and perhaps even a smaller group of people who speak on their behalf. And they're very loud and they have, in my view, dominated the conversation and dominated public policy in this area for a long time. Hey everybody, it's Rod Giltaka from the CCFR. You may have heard about the CCFR's conflict with this group, Doctors for Protection from Guns or something. 
Recently, the Canadian Coalition for Firearm Rights has launched an attack against doctors who involve themselves in this debate, echoing the famous NRA demand that doctors should shut up and stay in their lane. Gun control is not an argument about cigarettes. It's not an argument about seatbelts, okay? And that's why it's a lot more complex, and that's why we say stay in your lane. So that's not likely to happen that I'm going to shut up or that physicians are going to shut up on this matter. Uh, you know, everyone has uh, the right to engage in this debate. This is why we have formed this coalition, Canadian Doctors for Protection from Guns, because we believe that this is very much a public health issue. Public health facts, no gun lobby attacks. Hmm? On April 3rd, Doctors across the country participated in a day of action calling for stricter gun laws. An injury and death from guns is nearly a daily occurrence in Canada now. And, and it doesn't have to be this way. We can act. Dr. Ahmed led them to City Hall, where they were greeted by Mayor John Tory. Thank you so You're here as, as promised. Who has asked the federal government to ban handguns in his city. If it's going to save a life or two or three or four or five and save trauma for a lot of families of people who don't die, then isn't it something that you should be very seriously looking at doing? Okay. Okay. Dr. Cool. Ahmed was encouraged by the reaction to the doctor's rally. I feel like things are changing, uh, potentially. I feel that people are engaged. I feel that doctors and physicians have witnessed enough to make them believe that uh, now is the moment that we can change this trajectory. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. The federal government was expected to announce new gun control proposals, but it appears that with another federal election on the horizon, any further changes are on hold. Terence McKenna, CBC News, Toronto. Done with guns! Tomorrow, in the next part of our series, Terrence will take a close look at the limited gun control legislation now before Parliament. He will also tap into the heated debate over a proposal to ban handguns and assault weapons. Here's a peek. The AR-15 rifle was used in the Sandy Hook Elementary School shooting in Connecticut. I was in the gym and I heard like seven loud booms. The First Baptist Church shooting in Texas and in the Parkland school shooting last year in Florida. He went up and down the hallway, shooting into the classrooms he shot through my door. So that is the infamous AR-15 rifle. Mm -hmm. It's a semi-automatic only action. Mm -hmm. But uh, to us in the industry, it's quite laughable to think that this is more dangerous than another semi-automatic rifle. I've, I've battled, I've, I've tried to, i tried to hang in there and I've tried to come back and, and um, play, play the great game of golf again. I've been lucky enough to have had the opportunity to do it again. Tiger Woods has been awarded the Presidential Medal of Freedom. During today's ceremony at the White House, Donald Trump described the golfer as a global symbol of American excellence. Woods won his fifth Masters title last month. Well, here's some of the highlights from tonight's Met Gala, often described as fashion's biggest night out. Lady Gaga's dramatic entrance and four different outfits. Canadian Celine Dion posing in a gold Oscar de la Renta dress that weighs almost 10 kilograms. And actor and singer Jared Leto came with a mannequin on his head. Templeton Family Fun Night! <gasps> When it comes to children's shows, there's no shortage of choice these days, but a new study suggests there is a distinct lack of diversity. And that's a big concern for some parents who want their kids to see themselves reflected on screen. To Shauna Reed on what's being done to change that. So finally you reached the pixie cup. As a busy mom of three girls, therapist Sunit Lichmore does allow for some TV time at home. Remember to use the lightest, most delicate touch. But she's keeping a close eye on what her daughters are watching. The number one thing that sticks out to me is a lack of um, racialized people, the representation that does not really exist on television. Researchers looked at hundreds of hours of kids' TV shows and found they are missing the mark on diversity. When I say diversity, I'm not just referring to uh, gender diversity or racial diversity. I'm talking about economic diversity, uh, body shape, neurodiversity, physical differences.
Here's what the data shows in Canada. The study sample reveals zero representation of characters with physical disabilities. Racial diversity is also lacking. When it came to human characters in kids' shows, 74% are white. On screen, only 35% of characters are female, a percentage that hasn't changed in 10 years. And behind the scenes, men dominate as creators, writers, and directors. There was also the issue of how gender is portrayed on screen. We saw that uh, females were twice as likely to use magic to solve their problems uh, compared to males, and males were more likely to use STEM skills, so science and math, um, as well as physical strength. Do you really think the legend is true? Gender roles were top of mind for the creators of the new Canadian tween show, Detention Adventure. We always wanted um, uh, females to be sort of our protagonists and our leads in that way, because I think, you know, I was raised by my sister and my mother mostly, so they were very strong women, and I wanted to definitely portray that on camera. Lack of representation in children's programming is why Big Bad Boo Studios got into the business a decade ago. We were a little bit ahead of our time, and now it feels like people are starting to look at numbers, look at statistics, and pay attention more. Based in Vancouver and New York, the company has a wide range of shows, from an unconventional princess with two dads to the adventures of city kids in an apartment building. I ate everything on my plate and it was really delicious. Behind the scenes is a diverse team of creators, voice actors, and a gender-balanced writer's room. I wanted the writers to write for these characters from real experiences so that the episodes would resonate with kids. Yes. <laughs> Authors of the study say they're optimistic the TV industry is listening and the next decade will better reflect the world we live in. Tashana Reed, CBC News, Toronto. The moment is next. The surprising Canadian connection at Prince Harry's big announcement today. Thank you. Thanks, guys. <laughs> Did you spot it? We will explain next, but first. In case you missed it, a lot of big chess moves on Game of Thrones Sunday night. Major spoiler alert. Here's exactly what happened. Kidding, I'd never do that to you, but I do have a small spoiler. Turns out you can get takeout coffee complete with sleeve and plastic lid in Winterfell. Turns out the great Northern Art Department missed that little detail and then the editors missed it after that. Twitter, however, did not and had a hilarious field day with it. And you know what? It's happened before. Our heroes went north of the wall and apparently one of them left a perfectly good pickup truck behind. There it is, the Toronto skyline reflecting the big day in the UK. The CN Tower lit purple tonight to celebrate Harry and Meghan's new son. Now, in his surprise statement for the media, a pretty giddy Prince Harry thanked pretty much everyone who was there. And yes, if you look closely, there is a Canadian connection. We'll explain all that in tonight's moment. This little thing is, is, is absolutely to die for, so I'm just over the moon. Prince Harry clearly couldn't contain his excitement, which may explain why he also did this before leaving. Thank you very much, guys. Thank you. Thanks, guys. <laughs> so those are the horses in the background, and yes, he just thanked them. Perhaps he's just that polite, or maybe it's the lack of sleep. Either way, social media caught on fast and couldn't get enough of the horses in the back. Oh, I got the horses in the back. And in the spirit of fine investigative journalism, we've learned one of those horses is Canadian, Sir John, as in Sir John A. Macdonald, a gift from the RCMP to the Queen on her 90th birthday back in 2016. Thanks, guys. <laughs> hey, you're welcome, Harry, and congrats, Dad. <laughs> There's so many directions we could go here. Uh, I, I guess what I'll say is I, I find it kind of comforting and, and charming that even a royal is not insulated from the giddiness and exhaustion and bewilderment, befuddlement, I think, that new dads had. I've been through that, though, for the record, I did not thank any horses. Oh, good. Um, I, and I have to say, I, I watched that uh, announcement a couple times. I thought it was great. And then once I realized that the horse behind him, the internet pointed this out, was almost laughing, I cannot unsee it, and it is flat-out <laughs> hilarious. 
I loved how he was just rubbing his hands like yeah. with sweat the whole time because he knew he had to get his butt back to the wife and the kid. <laughs> we'll hear more in the coming days, I'm sure. And that is The National for Monday, May 6th. Good night, everybody. Good night. Good night.